Here we go. Hi, everybody. I have a special guest today, and that's the Oracle of Whimsy. Sitting here with the. Oh, Good uh, your sound is a little. I hope we're going to be okay in this recording. Well, fingers crossed. It sounds normal at this end. Yeah. Okay. So, hope you can hear us, guys. So, we're going to do a tarot blitz today on all sorts of things. Um, but Whimsy has another skill, and I'd like her to just give you a, a heads up on what is remote viewing. Um, so over to you, Whimsy. It's, uh, thanks. It's nothing really very uh, scary. It's a te uh, telepathy technique. Uh, different uh, cultures throughout the world uh, use telepathy, which is a way of connecting to other people. The way I use uh, remote viewing is called the heart-centered remote viewing technique. And it's based on studies from uh, indigenous cultures, uh, shamanic traditions. I'm also interested in the shamanic traditions out of Tibet. And it's a five-step technique where we are able to basically connect with the heart of another person and gain information about their worldview. And it's traditionally been used to uh, create mediation and uh, avoid war, also to spy on people in the, in the cases of war. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's currently being used in the United Nations, these meditation techniques, to help wow. open up the way for dialogue. Yep. Okay, so Whimsy will be bringing both her heart-centered technique and the tarot to this. So we've got this monster list. We'll try and keep it down. So let's start, Whimsy. We thought both Roger Stone and Michael Flynn are coming up for sentencing. So let's start our blitz with those two. Okay. So okay. do you want one person at a time or...? Uh, well, I think we both throw cards and I'll just say over to you or I'll jump in and rudely talk over the top of you. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> okay. Roger Stone first. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Roger. For those people who don't know, a blitz takes five minutes or less. Yeah. We're just quickly dipping into these people. Okay. So Roger Stone... Let me move this up here. Roger Stone. What is going to be with Roger Stone? Ooh. <laughs> uh, he's in trouble. Yeah, you'd have to say, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, what have you got for him? Well, first off, we have a Six of Pentacles as his base, which is benefactor to help somebody who's in a vulnerable situation. This is something I saw in previous remotes is that he's going to be offered. One of the reasons they avoided sentencing him until February is they're giving him an opportunity to come clean with the feds and to basically turn state's evidence. Um, so you can see the six of pentacles giving them him an offer. He cannot refuse the person in a vulnerable situation. And then the second base card, as you can see, is the ten of swords, which is to be trapped. What's interesting aspect of the Ten of Swords is that the person has placed themselves in that situation of entrapment, mm. either through their own actions, their own stupidity, etc. Yeah. Well, I get the Seven of Gardens, which is the Seven of Pentacles, illusion, delusion. This is a man, I think, who's on the one hand led a completely deluded life in terms of his fame and power but at the same time he has had fame and power which he's chosen to abuse and um I, I think he has a lot of dirt on a lot of people it's almost as if he puts epstein in the shade in some way but it's it's like that and then i get the king of gardens king of pentacles the greedy king mm -hmm. He's broke. The Queen of Wands. So has, I'm not sure who um, the judge is in his case. I can't remember. But I think this could be it's, either. It's the female judge that threatened to put him in prison if he didn't stop his Twitter twittering. Amy Brennan, that was her. Yeah. She's going to come down hard on his sorry. That's what's yeah. So I think he's overstepped the mark 
he's overreached, he's probably been hanging out for a pardon. But from what I've been um, reading in the last couple of days, even if Trump isn't convicted, an impeached president can't pardon people. Is right. that right? Does anyone know any it's, legal viewers? I think it's. I think there's a legal problem with it. Uh, going into the first and second houses for Roger Stone, you can see death in his current situation, and again, feeling cornered. This is somebody who has to deal with the feds, and he has to turn states' evidence because he's really uh, wound up in a pretty awful situation. And I was also going to say his fourth house, he's broke. This is a guy who can't even afford to pay his lawyers at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, also could be, we could be seeing him even having a change in lawyers or trouble um, with his lawyers. Again, the fact that there's an ace of cups in his fourth house would suggest that he's already made a deal with the feds. And you can see the king of pentacles coming in the sixth house, which was crossing, uh, uh, joins with the fourth house, which was the inverted uh, seven of pentacles. This, this, uh, king of pentacles is broke. Yeah. His, his only chance of getting out the ace of swords is if he turns state's evidence. Yep. I think that's quite likely. Okay. Now let's motor on to Michael Flynn. I've decided to move back to the right away because it's kind of nice having the same pack and we'll see what happens. So Michael Flynn, hand on heart, Mia Culpa sort of uh, um, went in saying, I'm guilty, ooh, ooh, seemed to cooperate with Muller, got um, an elephant stamp and a gold star from Muller not to get a heavy sentence or even jail time. And then he completely flipped. Right. He thought he could get off. He thought he could get off. He got those maniac Fox lawyers and... <laughs> Let's see what's going to happen to Michael Flynn when he's sentenced now. Michael Flynn. I keep seeing four. Four months or four years. Okay, yeah. Look. Oh, I my get God. a judgment card for him, you know, first yeah. off. Jesus. The Page of Cups, which was the naivety. He's not a young man, but there is a naivety vibe to this when he changed, things are now moving very fast for him. And I would suggest out of his control now, regardless, altogether. Then he gets, um, in his hopes and fears, he's still holding out a slight hope that he can manipulate and juggle his way through. May not. No, it's the swords. He's going to jail for some time. You get the fours. Well, here's what I have as the basis. Look at these bases. Five of cups. Ooh, he's out. out. He still feels like he retained something, but look at the ten of swords moving in. Yeah. So this is somebody who has run uh, his race. Uh, the only thing he can do at this point is try and make sure all of his ducks are in a row because there is some uh, legal discussion here. Uh, that maybe he can show himself some grace, but there's a tower moving in in his fourth house. Look at this. This is his fourth house. Look at his third house. Oh. Uh, so he's... There's a deep irony with Flynn, which is he could have skated with just shame to deal with, and now he's going to deal with real jail time. They follow his money also. There seems to be something coming up in the cards that... Uh, an exchange of finances. They were tracking bank accounts, money, offshore accounts, both with, both with him and with other people that were under investigation. And it was by, by tracking this money that they were able to catch people. Mm. It wasn't the phone calls. It was also the finances. And look at these guys. It's all about the grubby money, isn't it? It's, they never have enough. And Roger Stone has tapes. Uh, and the oh. feds know he has tape, but he's going to have to do better than showing blue tapes to the FBI because when I see him showing that hand, oh, I taped my parties, that's not going to be an, enough to uh, get him out of the situation he's in right now. Mm -hmm. Now, let's have a quick look at Devin Nunes because, you know, he, he bluffed his way through those hearings in the most scandalous fashion possible. And let's see, 
what's going to turn up for Devon Nunes? Oh, God. Are these cards not horrible? <laughs> I haven't got there yet. Hold on. <laughs> what have I mean, you got? Up till oh. now, anybody had good cards? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, ow, 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 ouchie, ouchie. What I get for him too, leading off, ripping off, but ripping off everybody, it's like not only people he's ripped off, like the undocumented workers he undoubtedly uses on his farm, he's ripped off the American people by keeping up that pantomime that he was just another GOP person when he was actively involved. I also always get that Russian vibe with the Cossack hat and the boots going on here. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's not Russian money involved as well. The fool thought he was smarter than he was. And he's just at his beginning of his horror journey, right at stage one. And he could well be the martyr for the GOP on many levels. When this all turns to sawdust and there's blood on the floor, Nunes will be one of the ones that I think will have to take the fall for maybe five or six GOP behind him, you know, somehow in this. I think he is going to be martyred to this story. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the remote viewings we did. We started the remote viewings a couple of years ago and putting ourselves in the shoes of Barack Obama, where the intelligence agencies had gone dark and were monitoring the situation and were intercepting phone calls. And the reason that they let it go on so long is because they were trying, they didn't want the people to know that they were under surveillance. And unfortunately, Nunes appears to be one of the persons that was under surveillance because he was speaking to. Uh, Russian nationals like Lev Parnas. So the fact that those tapes and that information was intercepted by the NSA is the issue. What I see here is an ace of cups and a three of cups. So he still has a chance to uh, make some kind of deal with the feds, uh, mm -hmm. but he's going to have to abandon this president. So uh -huh. and the fact that they've got evidence against him, there's a, it's, pretty close to the point at which they're going to show their hands and probably secretly are already discussing something with Nunez and his attorneys because the three of pentacles is moving in. So I think what's probably going to happen is they're going to secretly meet him, show him what they already have and give him an opportunity to work with them. So that basically means that Nunez is going to have to uh, join the other side at this point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's, jump around the world now so yeah. i'd be interested in having a quick look whims at um some of the key global players so let's start kim jong-un is firing up again um trump of course you know his mind's on other things now um but this will be and kim jong-un i think is taking advantage of that so let's have a look what's happening with North Korea and America, but inside Kim Jong-un's head. Okay, sounds fun. Kim Jong-un, North Korea, what's the plan? Perspective of the remote viewer is fun, but not for the world leaders. <laughs> yes. Oh, God. He, he's he got hideous cards, I have to say. Oh, yeah? Okay, what I've got here is uh, the reluctant offer in the sense, I, I'd describe it more as the lukewarm offer. So he thought he was getting somewhere with Trump, but Trump in typical Trump fashion just kept going. I think my vibe on this is Kim Jong-un thought he was the most imperson, yeah. important person for Trump when in fact he was probably 176 you know and that's what sort of set him off now is this feeling that he's back to being a despotic nobody on the global scale and he wants to make a ruction um here he goes he's got internal political problems 
because I, I basically feel generally, it's, to me, it's the same with Russia, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, you can't keep young people away from the net forever. And I think he's got opposition in more than one form coming for him. And he's feeling embattled. And he's not dissimilar from Trump. If he feels threatened, he lashes. So look out, world. So I might go a bit further. What You tell me what you think and I'll just do some cards on whether he's going to actually... Well, he's an interesting person to remote in the sense that he's a lot like Trump emotionally. Yeah. Go into the energy and he's about two, three years old emotionally yeah. and he will have temper tantrums and stomp around if he doesn't get his way, if he doesn't get attention. I don't see, I don't see violence with him. Instead, it's more uh, uh, temper tantrums in order to get attention from the world stage because anytime we're not paying attention to him and giving him what he wants, this is what he does. He yeah. uh, threatens. You can see uh, frustration, wanting to move towards some kind of position uh, with the United States. He wanted to be important. He wanted to be as important as the United States. He didn't want to be the poor uncle who's embarrassed because he can't feed his own people. And he's another person who feels that he's been betrayed by uh, Trump. He thought that Trump made him feel special. Trump made yep. him feel like an equal. And the fact that he has not gotten the bumper return in Korea that he was promised uh, is, is part of why he does these kinds of threats. They're, they're threats to get attention. I'm going to do this if you don't love me. I'm going to do this if yeah. you don't give me what I want. But it's yeah. really wanting to be rescued by the West because the economy is so bad in this country. Exactly. So I'm just going to do a quick throw. I don't know if you want to. Is this an active threat to the West? Either way, Trump needs to pull out something dramatic to take the attention off him too. So either way, is this going to escalate? Okay. This is North Korea and Trump. Is it going to escalate? <laughs> this is a classic. It sums up the two of them. They could make a pact, but they won't. <laughs> so it's like there's an opportunity to talk again, but because Trump's moved on, he's going to ignore that and leave the threat out there both ways. You know, the world, South Korea is probably more vulnerable than America, um, even Japan. So he's going to do something with his big stick uh, because he's not getting the friendship overtures. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting uh, going into this and looking at the cards. Um, there is cultural sensitivity that South Korea has towards North Korea's situation that I think has a lot to do with uh, Asian culture about publicly shaming people. Mm. If someone's poor, if someone has holes in their shoes, if someone's humiliated because they're in a public situation, but uh, they don't want their poverty to be on public display. Mm. There's a feeling of like of that between him and South Korea. So South Korea has the sensitivity to go in and clean up Kim Jong-un and make uh, North Korea presentable to the West because what I see is a desire for him to open up not only to trade, but also he wants to open up to tourism. He really feels that North Korea's chance of joining the West isn't just trade, but being open to marketing themselves as a vacation resort. It's first with diplomats and people from South Korea, but then expanding to the rest of the world. And it looks to me like it's going to be a process. What he desperately wants is to open up North Korea to uh, tourism and to trade with the South so that they can save their finances. But he's terrified of the spy card. The fear is spying. Uh, and uh, it's almost like he has agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. always like terrified, but it's the terrified junkyard dog I always talk about who's cowering in the junkyard, starving, mm. and somebody has to go in with compassion, put a blanket on them, mm. and you know, get you know, that per that is probably going to be South Korea. Yeah, that's really interesting, and I think Trump almost 
accidentally solve the problem just by treating him as another person and going in in the photo ops and stuff and saying, oh, nice beaches or whatever he said about wanting yeah. hotels. He almost did it. And then because of the lack of follow through, that forced him back into his emotional cocoon that happens to be heavily armed and repressive. It right. Could have and, expanded. and he doesn't have enough money to keep this up, the arms race up. So having a temper tantrum and threatening to break all of his toys uh, until you come into the room and love him, mommy. And that's the kind of uh, a terrified, absolutely terrified of spies, yeah. uh, terrified of uh, reneging on, on deals, walking mm. away. I keep seeing uh, South Korea wanting to come in almost like a therapist and help them. Uh, well, I hope they do. I really hope they do, you know. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be. Okay, so North then Korea. You don't go in, you get, you, you, you know, that's a, you go into it from a remote viewing perspective and you feel sorry for them. Even if it's a rabid dog that's killed people, you just feel like, dang, I feel sorry for that poor dog. Oh, bless. <laughs> bless your higher self. With and me. I feel sorry for his victims, you know. Obviously. Well, of course, yes. Uh, eating grass in the cold, you know, I mean, it's shocking. Dying of worms because they don't have enough money to buy deworming medications. Oh, look, it's just shocking. Um, Boris, let's go to Yeti 2, okay. that strange election. Uh, I think people were just exhausted and let's just get Brexit done was the vibe. But let's see what's on the card, so to speak, for Boris Johnson. Oh, this is so much fun. This is the first time I've done a blitz with somebody else and I love it. Ah, uh, great. Go, Boris. It is fun. Isn't it fun to do blitzes? Yeah, we'll have to do more of these. Yeah, absolutely. Chick chalk. <laughs> well, this is. Well, this the first card I get off the rank. The Nine of Pentacles. Someone who has had a comfortable life and a lot of opportunities and a little out of touch. Um, which is actually Boris's story. One of the deep, stupid things about him being the face of Brexit is he's a Europhile. All his family um, live all over the world, particularly in Europe. He spends a great deal of time in Europe. He speaks four languages. Uh, I mean, it couldn't be more removed from his background. And it's interesting that his own family have walked away outraged at this sort of narrow-minded, mean-spirited rubbish that is his current political position. He's had every opportunity and he chose not to exercise that or his considerable intellect. He was always a buffoon. He started as a journo, funnily enough, and, and then he got sacked because he just made up stories. <laughs> he's shameless Boris is shameless but things aren't looking good Pip you'd have to say it won't take long he's naive he's been on the the fringes of um, politics for 30 or 40 years only because he went to school with all the players um, but he was a lefty who went to the right and they're always a bit weird mm -hmm. right so He's still an adolescent, you could say. But this, I think, is not just for Boris. The devil card is not just for Boris. It's for the UK. There is every chance the UK is going to splinter under his steering. It's, it's funny. Sometimes people f have fought, well, in Ireland for 600 years and Scotland for six or eight hundred years, all these historical things that never allowed them to actually pull away and be themselves. And it's this right wing stuff in the end that could push them over the cliff. Even Northern Ireland is considering um, that the election in Northern Ireland was fascinating um, for the first time. 
these Protestants, for those who aren't familiar with the history of um, the separation of Ireland, basically England, when it came in in the 14 and 1500s, planted Protestants <laughs> to actually be a bulwark against the Catholics. And in the 1970s, when I was involved in Irish politics, a, a lot of what Sinn Féin and the Republicans were fighting for was you couldn't vote if you were Catholic. Only Protestants could vote and landlords could vote, but not tenants. And the courts had a 99% conviction rate. So it only needs someone to say, you're IRA and you were in, thrown in jail for 25 years to life. So it was outrageous. We're not talking ancient history there. We're talking 70s and 80s. So it's even possible that Ireland will come to a deal with itself. But the point is, why is the UK doing this? It doesn't make sense. It's an emotional decision. Everyone sort of hides behind their own nationalism and the idea of sovereignty, and it sounds great, you know, all of this chest-beating stuff. But the world's moved on, and it means they will be in chronic isolation, chained to the devil that is Brexit. That's what I think. Well, I keep seeing it from the perspective of NATO, embargoes, controlling the price of oil, sales of certain things, the benefit to Putin if he can start to sell cheap oil to Europe, which would weaken NATO, it would, it would weaken OPEC. Um, the problem I see here is that England could wind up wind up at the end of this as a country with very little power the same with the united states yeah. by, lose by, you know by withdrawing from the world stage theoretically they become just another country in europe which you know depending upon how you look at it that's not necessarily a bad thing but it could mean a, a time of um real frugality coming to england mm. Oh, I think they haven't even touched the austerity that's going to come. It's going to be truly shocking and awful. I don't, it, it's, it can't feed itself. It's going to have to import every lettuce and every banana and pay more for it. It's going to pay more for everything. It's crazy. Yeah, I think they could still uh, work out either a light Brexit or no Brexit, which is something that I had seen in the past, just because there's so, there, every time I go into this from a remote perspective, uh, energetically, I see all these laws and treaties that go back hundreds of years between them and Scotland, them and Wales, that, and it's just a mess. And you have to bring in barristers and academics to go through stuff I mean, it's all about the legality. Yeah. The contracts, uh, the contracts of severing, uh, scholarship. Also, there's a possibility that they could be bribing. Actually, they're going to have to be paying more because instead of paying the EU, they're now going to have to pay Scotland not to split, Northern Ireland not. They're going to have to actually bribe them to actually accept this. So there goes the money that they theoretically, you see what I'm saying? So Yeah. No, I totally see. And there's another irony, too, that I've never actually seen Brexit properly fully happening. I think yeah. it's going to be in a holding pattern, and Boris could even announce it on the 31st of January, but I don't think it's going to happen in the way that those who support Brexit and are just proud Brits and we can do it on our own and let's go back to when we were great and we had the empire and we controlled most of the world. <laughs> um, I don't think in real life that's going to actually happen still, even at this late stage. Yeah. Because it's too fundamentally stupid. Okay. Now, we could look at Putin, but let's save him for another day. What's just crossed my mind is... Talking about all these global issues, how people should look at the global economy and what you think is going to happen now with, let's say, next one to five years 
the global economy as opposed to individual countries? What do you think? Yeah, sounds fun. Okay. Let's look at the global economy. Interesting. This is not half bad. Mm. Global economy. Mm. Interesting. Wow, I'm getting some really interesting stuff here. Uh -huh. Say global. Very interesting. You want to start? Yeah, no, you go. Basically, what's kind of interesting is it has to do with world trade, and it goes back to the remote we had done on Vladimir Putin, where whether you like Putin or not, uh, he keeps talking about the fact that America ha is from his perspective of bullying people into having a relationship. You have to buy, you have to buy a phone service from ATM. You have no other choice. It's only ATM. And then we broke up Ma Bell and now people have cheaper phone service. So every time you go into Putin's energy, he's talking about the fact that America cannot continue to bully the world that we only buy, that America is going to control money and trade what could be happening in the next uh, few years is that we're actually going to be seeing trade coming out of the third world and it's actually going to be boosting the economy of the third world there seems to be a fairness emerging through these new trade routes where small countries remote areas that had a uh, really poor gdp because they were a stranglehold due to uh, uh owing a massive amounts of uh, debt to the world bank there seems to be more equality moving in and an opportunity uh, uh, for financial equality, particularly in Africa. I see some uh, good trade opening up in Africa and also in remote uh, island uh, countries as well. There's uh, an improvement in sales, but even though America and other countries that had traditionally uh, been heading the world stage go into almost kind of an austerity or a smaller economy, Globally, it seems more fair in the sense that we're breaking the chains with former contracts, yeah. uh, doing the work, the international courts coming in and siding with those countries that were bankrupted by uh, taking out loans they couldn't pay back. There just seems to be this desire for equality uh, globally, uh, green trade, and also what I think uh, China and Russia are doing with these new trade routes is really opening up an opportunity for areas that had been embargoed and blocked because of a lack of infrastructure to finally get their trade out. And I think in the end, it's ultimately going to be a good thing. That is fascinating because what I've got here is... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Starting off, you know, with worry and concern and anxiety about everything and I can see a fairly significant recession coming soon. But the result's not going to be the usual results. So you have the King of Cups coming in, which I think is that father energy, a more paternal energy as opposed to paternalistic in the sense of, we will tell you who you can trade with and who you can't. Mm -hmm. A kinder energy to revisit, yeah. leading to further and unprecedented paths. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Because finally there is to be some justice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. F to be some justice. Now, this is in first world, second and third world countries because we have the Wheel of Fortune here that karmically this is overdue. So whether we're talking about Australia, the UK, US, Canada and stuff, we have problems with wealth distribution. We have the working poor. We have all these issues. And this has to be addressed, but also on the global scale. That it's going to be a brave new world in a different way, which is, I think, leading into the thing that I, I wanted to sort of finish with you today, which is 
how people handle this next four to five years. And we're at a crossroads of cowering and being worried or, you know, just struggling day to day or, or having the courage to envision something really radically different. You know, and this is really radically different. <laughs> I think that there's actually comfort in living a simple, frugal life where you always have enough. Do you really need to have a home that's 17,000 square feet? Maybe <laughs> you can be comfortable with a home that's 1,500 square feet or 1,000 square feet and money in the bank and only living on, say, 50 or 60% of what you earn. And it's better for the environment. It's, it's fair globally. And we only take what we need. It's not saying that green, green capitalism isn't about uh, poverty. It's about working in, uh, in the natural order, which is to uh, be kind and take care of the earth. And then the earth takes care of your needs. So that's the paradigm shift. That's the shift that's coming in. And it's also being able to stand back and not just see things from the perspective of the Americans, but from the perspective that even though we may not like Putin, even though we may not be fans of China, the truth of the matter is they're building infrastructure and, uh, and roads in areas that desperately need them. And there's, there's, some, there's a global benefit in that. Yes, I think so. And you mentioned Africa briefly, and it's the same thing. It's an extremely wealthy, well-endowed continent uh, that's been strangled and subdued by all the Western powers that leapt in there. And um, so I think you can extrapolate that, that we've been such energy and consumer pigs in first world countries. I think you'll find we don't need three bathrooms, you know. No. Um, and so we've these resources. And in fact, if we are more generous with each other and beyond, it's going to be an infinitely better world. Right. Uh, again, tackling the fear and saying, okay, it's all right to do things really differently. I think people are inherently nervous about big change. I mean, that's the argument about Bernie versus Biden. Oh, too radical, too radical. We need radical to save the basics, let alone the brave new world. So I think with younger people coming through, the younger, the generation under millennials um, are going to see the world in a very different way. And when you say to them, oh, well, 1% of the world's people own everything, you know what? They're not going to be impressed with that. It is not going to make sense to them that this is what you mean by business as usual. This is what you want to keep doing. You think this is okay. It is not okay. And I think we've basically just got to live it out and individually do what we can, like you say, living modestly, being generous, helping where we can, and supporting each other in this. Industry. Yeah, and taking care of the earth. And the great irony of all of this, the final outcome, energetically, is there's this retraction. Everybody takes care of their roads, their infrastructures. We stop, block all these blockades, and then ultimately in the next three to five years, we really do become a global village because we start realizing that, hey, uh, the the produce is really good in Madagascar. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, and wow, I really like those um, those nuts I can get from Zimbabwe or wherever. Yeah, the the point being that by being open to trade in areas that had been uh, basically bankrupted by the way things were in the past. Uh, we get to a true globalism and we get to know our, the world becomes more flat, more equal, and we get to enjoy um, all these amazing benefits from these countries and these cultures that previously had been isolated. I think that's totally, totally true. <laughs> more I think it starts, it's not that it's not going to be painful in the next few years, it is, but it's important to have a bigger, more optimistic vision of where we want it to go rather than being subjected to saying, oh, look, unless my candidate gets in, my world's going to collapse. 
I think it needed the, the water situation in Flint, Michigan, now in Newark. And I don't know, really don't know why people from New Jersey aren't protesting every day in New York and getting on cameras saying, we are in America and we can't drink our water. Right. You know, I think it has to come back to basics, real basics, you know. So um, to all our intrepid viewers out there, please, as I say to you often, with love in my heart, you know, it's important, stay strong, take time out because the news is shocking and it's really important not to disengage altogether from the news but to not let it overwhelm you on a daily basis. Really take time out to take some positive, even if it's five minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, to try and get that open-hearted, good, positive energy that we can do this differently and better. And it's no harder than doing it badly <laughs> with all the stress and the drama and the disappointment convert the outrage into expressing ways to help but the vision is what i keep coming back to envision well, we, we better are confronting, we are confronting the bully right now yeah confronting the bully right now do we like to be bullied no we don't no what do people like to be bullied no they they don't they want what we want they want the good life we all want the good life we all want to feed our children we all want our children to have good educations and clean drinking water and we're in this together and i think that yep. that's that's the new that that's really the global awakening yes and i think it's not just us who um have this esoteric sort of way of looking at the world and stuff um i think there is momentum there's genuine momentum globally for this to change it's like these bottlenecks like trump brexit um, our bushfires. We've got these bottlenecks because as individual populations, we've failed to pick up on the messages. So we had to go through this extreme sort of rebirthing moment. I'm doing this birthing canal sort of imagery with my hands. <laughs> and we're right there now. And it's possibly a breach birth. We're really struggling with moving to this next stage, which is so much better. And I think the planet can be saved and we need to do things radically and quickly, not, oh, well, bit by bit, the time for Band-Aids is over, you know. Big hearted change. May love reign. <laughs> so, Whimsy, I'd like to thank you very much. Anything else you want to add? I was just going to say that you and I are headed towards the busy season now, January, and that's. I'm glad that we're we're starting starting that on a positive note because I know a lot of people will will come in and get their uh, reading starting in January just because yes. of the how the year starts. And, uh, yes, yes, and I think it, 2020, everything about it is massive. And I like the imagery of 2020 vision. It's suddenly like I think the veil will lift for many, many people everywhere. It's just not sustainable in this way. We have to get energy from each other and clarity from ourselves and the universe to move forward in the most positive way we humanly can. Yeah, and I think everybody is getting past all of the consumerism of the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And the vampant nature of all of that. And uh, it's almost like we had to take a really ugly look at it the last couple of years to say, yeah. this is not it. This is not what makes me happy. And uh, living the good life, the simple life, and, and really being kind and, and, and helping one another and the planet. And, and really nothing else is all that important. Exactly. And if we do that, the rest takes care of itself. That's right. That's right. If we have a really simple, clear vision for doing things really differently. Be brave, be strong. Okay, guys. Thank you so much. This is a total pleasure, Whimsy. Yes, I hope we can do this again. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Okay. Cheers now. <laughs>